I recently had a viewer request an episode. Ah yes, Israel vs Palestine. An episode that I'm fairly confident won't be going out of date anytime soon. This is the perfect issue to cover right now too, because I can use some deep seated hatred to spice up my comment section. So first, Israel and Palestine's gritty origin story. Because this conflict was one of many that started with a presumably mustache twirling British man looking at a map and thinking to himself, eh, it's getting late, let's just put a line here and call it a day. Nobody's gonna care. In fact, it was a 67 word declaration in 1917 that really kicked this thing off, declaring, his Majesty's government's view of the favor of the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people. So yeah, right from Jump Street, things are not looking great for the Palestinians. Or as this declaration called them, non-Jewish communities in Palestine. Alright, so there might be a few troublesome areas with this declaration. Most notably, if even after you double space it and take in on the margins, your entire settlement plan for a country still doesn't fill a page. That's right, I see how large you had to make your signature. Maybe take a few extra hours to flush it out. You can't dictate enormous policies in 423 characters. N never mind. Now, for the more practical problems, and this is a big one, at the time you wrote this, the territory of Palestine was still controlled by the Ottomans. A modern equivalent would be Donald Trump tweeting that Syria will now be a Scientologist community. That said, if anyone can take down ISIS, it might be Tom Cruise. Which leads us to problem number two. The Jewish population made up between 3 and 5% of the population at this time. To again put this in perspective, this would be like if a 10 times more powerful China proclaimed that, guess what, America is now going to be run by Asian Americans. They make up 5.5% of our population. So clearly this was not a recipe for a group hug. Then in 1922, Britain formally got permission to rule over Palestine, which went about as well as you'd expect. Interestingly enough though, while not being able to unite, both Jews and non-Jews seem to somewhat find a common enemy in Britain. Because when everyone's sure that the land belongs to them, it becomes remarkably clear who the land doesn't belong to. That said, this political system recognized the Jewish historical right to rule all of Palestine and gave Jews complete political power, while recognizing that Arabs had political power in the rest of the Arab world. Then came World War II, a time when Jews looked at life in Europe and life in Palestine and thought, yeah, we'll take our odds with the Arab world. It turns out that, and this may surprise some of you, but when it comes to taking in refugees, America and other powers were not really fans of taking in refugees. So none of them really put up the biggest fight when people started to leave in droves to go to Palestine. This led to... At Flushing, Long Island, the General Assembly of the United Nations has made its decision on Palestine. The map shows what partition means. The Jewish state colored light, the Arab state dark, Jaffa to go to the Arabs, Jerusalem internationalized. Yeah, in 1947, after every political group in Palestine hated the British, they pretty much just... They backed away and left it up to the UN. Who agreed on a map that even Wisconsin voting districts would say looked messed up? Now, Israel accepted these terms, but having experience being passed around like a pipe at a Willie Nelson concert, the Palestinians wanted to get all of their land. So they didn't agree, an argument that didn't quite make it past the receptionist. Immediately after this agreement was passed, the day after Ben Gurion declared the state of Israel, the armies of Egypt, Jordan, Iraq, Lebanon, and Syria invaded. Wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. You mean to tell me that some countries don't respect the supreme power of the United Nations? Now, I'm going to hit the fast forward button a little bit, but long story short, Israel kicked butt in that war and increased their size by one third. Then, the Six Day War happened in 1967 and Israel really kicked butt in that one and grew by even more, occupying the West Bank, Golan Heights, Gaza Strip, and Sinai Peninsula. 
Yemen and then gained control over the West Bank, the Gaza Strip, the Sinai Peninsula, and the Golan Heights. So the 1947 proposal looked like this. By 1967, things looked like this. Now, things started changing at this point, because this was the point when Israel caught our eye, and it was love at first sight. Over the next decade, we launched a campaign to get all of our Arab friends to like them, which changed the conflict from Arabs against Israel to more Palestine against Israel, with Arab states being more like mean girls than straight up bullies. Don't worry, Palestine, we're still on your side. We won't let Israel eat at our table. So yeah, the US helped negotiate a return of the Sinai Peninsula. And again, I don't want to make it seem like everyone was just buddy-buddy, because around this time we were still hearing The Middle East War produced developments all over the world today. The oil-producing countries of the Arab world decided to use their oil as a political weapon. They will reduce oil production by 5% a month until the Israelis withdraw from occupied territories. That's right, these negotiations were going on under Jimmy Carter. A man most famous for being the answer you forgot on your history final. Ah, oh, dude, I wrote down Gerald Ford for that one. This leads to the problem we're seeing today, because Israel has started to build settlements on the land they won in wars against Palestine. And I would be much angry about Israel taking land they've won in wars against an unrecognized state, except then I'm worried that Chief Seattle might overhear me and take back whatever that big city that we won was after defeating his tribe in the battle for Seattle just around 50 years before the Balfour Declaration was made. And the question remains, were these settlements legal? Then in 1993, two important things happened. Hamas launched their first attack against Israel, and I was born. No relation. This actually leads us to the closest we've ever come to seeing an Israeli-Palestinian peace, when Bill Clinton decided to take a break from charming interns to turn his charm to Yasser Arafat. Look at him, just getting ready for a group hug between the PLO and Israel. Now, this is a really important point where we can start looking towards future solutions, and the future in general. Now, I know these talks took place in 2000, and I've heard a few things have changed in the Middle East since then. It's the closest we've come to peace though, so let's get started. These negotiations spanned five main topics. Refugees, territory, Jerusalem, security, and settlements. And oof! Looking at that list, it's pretty hard to say, let's start with the easy one. So first, let's talk about territories, which ties in with settlements. So Palestine's proposal was... Israel, let's go back to the way things were back before the Six Day War. If you give us the West Bank and Gaza Strip and finally recognize us as a state, everything will be good. These settlements you have, we can negotiate a one-to-one -one land swap and we'll be all good. But don't offer up the Haluza sand region in that swap, because that land is garbage. Believe me, we have enough sand. Now Israel's response was, okay, okay, we hear you. We'll give you the Gaza Strip and 73% of the West Bank. But over the next 10 to 25 years, which let's face it means 25 years, he'll expand to 92% of the West Bank through land swaps and us leaving 63 of our settlements. This is where that conversation ended in a tacit agreement. Next came the problem of East Jerusalem. A problem Trump might have just solved with all the tact of fixing a TV with a sledgehammer. This might surprise some of you, but this was the issue with Israeli President Barack saying it was the central issue that will decide the destiny of the negotiations, and President Arafat saying he would not budge on one thing, the Haram is more precious to me than everything else. Well, that doesn't leave much wiggle room, but we'll try. The Palestinians wanted complete control over East Jerusalem which they saw as a part of the West Bank territory that they were owed, and the Jewish neighborhood and Wailing Wall would be put under Jewish authority, not sovereignty. Now Israel proposed the exact opposite, with Palestine getting custodial rights over Islam and Christian holy cities, while Israel got sovereignty over the entire region. And as you can probably imagine, 
This conflict wasn't easily resolved because it's hard to negotiate with people when there's a looming threat of an eternity in hell if a bureaucratic mistake is made. Also, I'm sure Clinton was thrilled to hear Israel had just, just thrown in the administrative rights for Christian neighborhoods for the Palestinians. Way to treat them like the free floor mats at a car dealership. Next came the question of security. Now this was less of a negotiation and more of a lecture by Israel. They wanted to put radar stations in Palestine to be able to deploy troops in Palestine, a demilitarized Palestine besides security forces, supervision of border crossings with Jordan, and the dismantling of UN recognized terror groups in the region. Now we're not sure if these demands were received, but judging by the realities of a second intifada that we'll get to in a second, I'm gonna go out on a limb and guess not well. Finally, we'll get to refugees, because during the first Arab-Israeli war, many Arabs were pushed out of their homes. Palestine wanted resettlement for all of them, while Israel, fearful of losing its Jewish character, allowed for the reuniting of families and would pay for the resettlement of everyone else, which was somewhat agreed upon. Interestingly enough, the reception of these negotiations went very well in Palestine and very poorly in Israel. Unfortunately, presumably because Clinton liked the challenge, this negotiation was all or nothing, meaning that if there were any loose ends, there would be no agreement on anything, which ended up happening. Since then, the aforementioned Second Intifada happened, in which Hamas ramped up their rocket attacks and Israel ramped up their military attacks. Well, little actually changed in the geopolitical equivalent of banging two action figures together, the next big development was development. Israel's new prime minister is controversially building a ton of new settlements in Palestinian territories on the West Bank. Some are calling these territories illegal because they're on Palestinian land, while Israel is saying they aren't because Palestine isn't a country. Either way, this is making negotiations progressively more challenging because it makes the West Bank territory less and less available. The latest detail we heard is... Last month, I also took an action endorsed unanimously by the U.S. Senate just months before. I recognized Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. Now, despite what some people believe, the U.S. declaring something doesn't make it immediately happen. So don't worry, kids. You don't have to learn a new capital for your upcoming geography test. What this did do, though, was relieve the U.S. from the position of a neutral negotiator, a position we've had since before Carter, and give it to China. One of the biggest things to affect the conflict is also that Bibi the Builder, Israel's president, might find himself out of office, which could leave the door open to a more moderate leader. As far as China goes, though, they're focused on a four-point plan for peace. Wow, they were just waiting for Trump to do something controversial. They want to first advance the two-state solution based on the 1967 borders with East Jerusalem as the capital for the new Palestinian state. Which, alright, good luck with that last part. Second, they want to implement Israel's security desires while immediately ending any settlement building in the region. Third, they want to immediately restart peace talks, and lastly, they want to dump a ton of money into developing both countries, which certainly couldn't hurt. While the gap between Israel and Palestinian countries continues to, to seem wider, maybe Donald Trump did solve the issue by, how do I say it, inadvertently... Thank you, and that's all I have to say about that. Hello YouTube, I hope you enjoyed this last video. Subscribe by clicking on my eagle or do it the old fashioned way by clicking the subscribe button below. And remember to give me an old thumbs up.